Welcome back to 2010. Totally seminar. This is a, apart from being a seminar that is part of the program, the ideas, open to everyone to go to that course. So those that are registered, you may be satisfied and excited. It's a lot of fun. That's the only requirement. Some of you will be asked to be a local participant to the higher, to be asked to be top, some point, maybe this semester, maybe next. And the other thing that is important is that you will have an opportunity to interact with the speaker. So today's speaker comes from a different town. <laughs> uh, but uh, so uh, you can find me almost any time as far as this today. But uh, when we have outside speakers from outside town, they normally come for the whole day, so you can see that they are coming. And we are going to start doing a half an hour coffee before the seminar, so we can also talk to the speakers. We still need to implement the uh, where we sell the coffee and things like that. But uh, in the future, you, you, can, uh, you have an opportunity to talk to the speakers before the seminar. But remember that. Uh, when you see that uh, the speaker of interest uh, is coming, you can uh, contact Gabriela and get either your advice or yourself in the session. Okay. So um, we have a website and we have a tentative, well, we have a schedule for this semester. There are some people who are going to talk to now. And now uh, this is the idea of speaking to the speaker. So I think we'll introduce the He's the vice president of Space Systems. He has more than 40 years of experience in the aerospace industry. He has engineering degrees from the University of Notre Dame, where the weather is not that nice. Uh, <laughs> we do have better weather here. Um, he has experience working in engineering, program development, and management positions in places such as the United States Air Force, Ball Aerospace, and Spectrum Astro. And he has been directly involved in more than 30 satellite, satellite hardware and launch programs. So today he will introduce us to Digital Globe Satellite. Thank you for coming. Well, thank you. Uh, this is very informal, as is Digital Globe, so certainly feel free to ask questions as we go through. Uh, is there any particular time limit? 45. Okay. There are about 30, 35 charts here. A lot of imagery of what we have produced. Why don't we kill the lights? It'll be a lot easier to, to see this presentation. Um, Digital Globe started, uh, before I get into the charts, I joined Digital Globe essentially as employee number three in, uh, approximately 15 years ago in March. And I was sent out on one of the first days we moved into our building to go buy our first piece of capital equipment, which was a combined bottle opener, wine bottle opener, to celebrate moving into the building. So we went from $3 worth of capital equipment to being over capitalized over a billion dollars today. Uh, the company went public last May. Uh, stock has been doing reasonably well. And that's because the satellites that we've put up recently have worked very well. So it literally is an exercise in a very small startup company that was very successful and today is a major force in Boulder County. We went from a couple of employees to 500 today. We're located on the southern edge of Longmont, and the satellites you'll see here, uh, discussed here, are actually controlled from the basement of that building. In the basement of the building, there is about two petabytes worth of spinning disks and about four petabytes of offline storage. There are 300 megabits a second streaming into the building around the clock. So it shows you how much data is actually coming off of these satellites. I used to put that in terms of how many 50K uh, fax machines there was, but the number has gotten so big that you can't even relate to that any longer. As I said, we've spent about a billion dollars. Uh, we actually launched five satellites in the last 10 years. 
One uh, didn't last very long on orbit. One went into the ocean off of a Russian launch vehicle. But the three that are shown here are the currently operational satellites. Um, QuickBird was roughly an 1,100 pound, kilogram satellite. It was the first satellite capable of taking 60 centimeter images on the ground. And when I talk about what's called ground sample distance, basically you can think of it as we'll see something that's 60 centimeters on a side. Uh, as I'll show you in some of the imagery, the cameras actually work not too dissimilar than your eye, and it actually sees resolutions finer than 60 centimeters. Uh, this one was launched in 2001. This one was launched in uh, two years ago, and this one was launched literally in October 8th of this year. Uh, this is a very agile satellite. I'll show you some of the examples of that. And uh, this is a, quite a large satellite with a 1.1 meter optic. So the, the telescope literally, unlike your digital camera, that's got a little optic the size of your, your pinky, this has a 1.1 meter primary telescope buried in the back of that. So a very, comp very uh, capable set of satellites. But before I cover them in a little more detail, uh, the whole overall system is a lot more than the satellites. Most of the people in the building, whereas my team spends most of the money, out of the 500 people that are in the building, there are over 100 people, software engineers, who do nothing but keep the building running. With all the imagery coming in, orders coming in, what we call collection planning, figuring out how the satellites should actually go about doing their missions. So there's a whole series of people. Most of those 500 people are wrapped around sales or operating the business. We have ground stations in Tromso, Nor Tromso, I'm sorry, Tromso, Norway, Prudhoe Bay, on the very edge of northern edge of Alaska and in Fairbanks. And we flow data through another ground station in Troll in Antarctica that we don't actually own. It's owned by a Swedish company. So there are four ground stations spread around the globe. Massive image library, as I talked about earlier. Lots of production goes on in the building. The raw data comes in so chopped up, compressed, um, that it takes quite a bit of computing power just to bring it back into an actual image. And then, of course, the sales function that moves it out. There are three technologies that have really made the business possible. One is CCDs, the same things that are in your digital cameras. We use them differently. But that sensing technology allows for digital imagery. Two is storage. The amount of storage we have in the basement of the building right now would cover many football fields full of warehouses if it was the old tape drives of 20 years ago. And then, of course, personal computers. The fact that we can push imagery out and people can use it, Google can put it out on the web and people can surf around their neighborhoods or where they're going to go travel to, or you can, all the many different applications that have come out of this are all possible on personal computers. So it makes a huge difference from where it was 20 years ago when everybody needed mainframes to be able to work this kind of activity. Uh, lots of numbers on this chart. I really won't dwell on it substantially uh, in terms of, uh, but only a few of them. The satellites have gone up in altitude with Worldview 2 currently up at 770 kilometers. 770 kilometers takes you halfway into Montana, most of the way to Flagstaff, and oh, just barely this side of Kansas City. We can see you standing on the sidewalk from Kansas City a satellite moving at seven kilometers a second and tell you where you're standing in an absolute sense to about five meters. So that's how good the satellites are. Helps if you wear white. Um, these are the resolutions on the ground again. We actually take both black and white imagery and color imagery and then we color, we use the the higher resolution pan data to basically reduce or make a finer resolution on the color data, and I'll show you some examples of that. Uh, the swath width, unlike your digital camera, which has got a square focal plane and just takes a picture, we run big lines across the ground. So we run literally 16 to 17 kilometer swath widths in a line mode. If you're watching the imagery form up on a television camera, you'd watch a line go across the screen. So it wouldn't be snap and get an area, it would take some finite amount of time to do that. Panchromatic, which is black and white, plus a number of multispectral bands. Uh, here again, these are our spec numbers. We're actually doing a little better uh, in terms of geolocation accuracy. Um, I won't cover a lot of this. A lot more capa capability as the satellites evolved over the years. Um, 
size of the aperture on the satellites. So we've got 60 centimeter telescopes here and 110 centimeter telescopes. So I'll show you what this one looks like internally. The line arrays that we drag across the line, land, excuse me, across the land to form the image, we move across at different line rates. And as the satellites have gotten more capable, we literally move that across to 24,000 lines a second. So that says that little half meter chunk of terrain we're looking at, we literally integrate the photons for one twenty-four thousandth of a second to generate the imagery. And then we use a thing called time delay integration, and I'll show you that when we get to some of the subsequent charts. Um, these satellites are much more maneuverable because they use a thing called control moment gyros, uh, which I'm going to try to dwell on here. Um, satellite weights have gone up from, again, 1,000 kilograms to 2,600 kilograms, and the launch vehicles went up uh, similarly in terms of capacity. This was a QuickBird satellite we launched in October of 2001. I'll show you pictures fundamentally so that you get a sense of the size of these. This is about three meters tall, two meters or so in diameter. These are a couple of technicians. These satellites are built and integrated here at Ball Aerospace in Boulder. So that's one of the clean rooms at Ball. Uh, we do get parts of the instrument from what was Kodak, Eastman Kodak in Rochester. Um, Every time I think of my good old days at Notre Dame when I didn't see the sun for two months or three months straight, well, Rochester is about the same, same thing, and we spent a lot of time there. But you can get a sense of the size of the satellite. Uh, as satellites go, this one was a fairly medium-sized satellite. This is an image that QuickBird took of Boston. And I'm showing this only we could actually zoom in and get finer resolution. But Typically, there's a lot of resolution in here. There's a lot of detail in here. But typically, what people have seen in imagery from space is fairly broad areas, not a lot of high resolution, interesting to a variety of scientists and land use planners, but not always interested to the average public. And when we launched QuickBird, we were able to bring imagery down to a human scale. So this is an image of Tiananmen Square in China. All of these dots are people. And you can see down into the detail of the flag here and the people standing around. So when Google saw this stuff, they said, hot damn, we're going to put this out in some applications that they were even smarter than we were in terms of what they ought to try to do. And they put out the satellite layer and laid it on top of their Google Maps. So now you can go, if you want to go to New York City, see the neighborhood you're going to stay in, or essentially any place in the world, uh, you can go to the satellite layer. Most of that satellite layer is still ours. Um, they are now buying some of the information from one of our competitors. But by far, the majority of it and the greatest, biggest library that exists is a digital globe library. But in addition to sites like that, the, the imagery can actually be used for lots of applications. This is a vineyard in Napa Valley. And you're literally seeing each row in the vineyard and by virtue of the false coloring that's used here, showing red in vegetation, you can tell the health of the vegetation. So you can literally tell where in this field it either needs more water, and it turns out that the best wines come from places that are a little stressed. Um, but farmers can use this to figure out what they ought to do with their fields, and you're right down again at that human scale. And of course, there are lots of applications for national defense intelligence. This is an armored depot in Russia. Every one of those is a tank or a truck. Um, this is one of the places where they store their vehicles. So it's easy for anybody interested in what's going on across borders to literally use this kind of imagery, which is available to anybody. By our license, we can sell this imagery to essentially anybody, if with the exception of a few denied, what are called denied countries. So QuickBird and actually a, a predecessor satellite that went up about a year before us called Iconos, which was with a competitor, actually stimulated this market. So let me talk some about how this actually happens and how, how the system works. Uh, this is the telescope that is on the QuickBird satellite and the World V1 satellite. That's a 60 centimeter aperture right there. It's got an aperture door that we open once we get on orbit. Light comes in, bounces off the primary mirror here, comes down to a secondary mirror, to a fold mirror, 
back up to a tertiary mirror, and then back down to the focal plane. Uh, mounted to this optical bench are these optical elements, obviously, but we also mount the star trackers to the optical bench. This system operates autonomously on orbit. We give it where we want to point. It figures out where it should do that by virtue of reading the star, the celestial sphere, figuring out from the star map that's on board the satellite uh, where the line of sight of the telescope is pointing, how to maneuver it to where it should point, uh, moving the line arrays across the, across the ground, and of course there are gyros in the loop as well, but fundamentally we rely upon these star trackers, which is a technology that evolved over the last oh, 15 years or so for literally sensing a bunch of stars, sending that to the spacecraft computer, the spacecraft computer says, here's my star map, I'm going to decide where I'm pointing, i.e. where the star trackers are pointing, and then we have to know very accurately from this line of sight to this line of sight to be able to point accurately. This is what the focal plane looks like. So the pixels we have in the QuickBird system, 27,500 pixels in multiple different arrays, but the total extent is 27,000 pixels, each of which in QuickBird were 12 microns a piece. Um, and that's for the pan, and we have a, a one quarter of that in the MS, and the MS pixels are a little bit bigger. So literally, the light coming in from that last mirror in the telescope comes down and strikes the CCDs. In the multispectral case, we've got the four Landsat band colors right here. Um, one of the interesting things in terms of creating an image from these kind of satellites is each one of these lines goes across the ground at a slightly different time, literally, you know, within fractions of milliseconds, but nonetheless, the satellite can maneuver or move slightly on orbit. So we actually have to realign all of this and know exactly what's going on with the attitude control system. Whereas your digital camera takes a picture and looks at all, all the colors all at once, we're actually formulating this image up from individual colors uh, that came across the, the ground very slightly different in time. So this focal plane array, of memory serves me, was about this big. So one of the challenges optically is how do you create a, a, a beam out of the telescope that maintains its image quality over something that wide. As I mentioned, the, the satellite maneuvers around and it does what we call push broom. That focal plane and the optical path from the telescope constitutes a two degree field of view coming out of the satellite. And that's the 16 kilometers on the ground. And again, the satellite is moving in this direction and, and actually doesn't have to, to scan directly in parallel to its ground track, but it does need to line up the, the detectors so that they're moving in a, in a known and precise direction. Um, so the satellite maneuvers, some people think, well, maybe, you know, you've got a telescope up there and it's got a gimbal on and it's moving around. The whole satellite actually maneuvers. So there, in this case, we've got reaction wheels up in the satellite here. Again, the star trackers are right there for determining attitude. And then, as I already mentioned, we've got the four different color lines and the panchromatic line all scanning across the ground at slightly different times. And then as the satellite actually comes over a particular area, the, one, the two degree field of view is a very small area, but because it can maneuver, we typically take within 30 degrees of looking straight down i.e. nadir, we can actually cover an area that's represented by this purple circle right here. So that's called the field of regard, which is the distance it can look at, and of course the field of view is much smaller. But the satellite can actually be turned around and look, we have great images of the moon. So there's nothing, nothing inherent about the satellite as to where it can actually point, other than pointing at the sun is a bad thing. And then ultimately, we can do numerous things in terms of the types of images. We can run strips, which literally just takes that swath width and runs it all along. Or we can do individual, what we call snapshots. We can put them together into an area, and we can scan in one direction, come back and rescan and create a stereo image. Less so on QuickBird, but now with the Worldview satellites and their greater agility, a much better capability. So the Worldview satellites started with 
the same basic technology, but improve the capacity by factors of four almost to 10. So this satellite weighs 2,200, 2,300 kilograms. Instead of a 1,000 watt solar array, it has a 3,000 watt solar array. The GSD at Nader is about the same, but instead of only being able to scan in one direction, we can actually scan right back. Uh, we can switch the electronics and read them out in reverse and scan backwards. So it, it covers area a lot quicker, uh, and that's combined with the agility that's up in this section, which is what we call control moment gyros. There's uh, 380 kilograms of hydrazine propellant on board. So then literally, uh, what's that, 600 pounds or so of mildly explosive fuel that comes out of thrusters on the back end here for maintaining the satellite in its desired orbit. Same star trackers, improved gyros. This is a, a picture of the satellite without the telescope in it, just to give you a sense of the size, although the perspective is a little bit uh, distorting here. But whereas QuickBird was three meters, this is four meters. It's a little bigger in diameter, again, considerably heavier. What we've done, though, is fundamentally evolved from each satellite to the next satellite uh, in terms of components and capabilities. And this is a picture. Uh, this is a picture in the ball clean room, not at the launch site. So you can see it's getting steadily larger. This is a picture without the solar rays on in what we call an anechoic, anechoic chamber. So we were doing electromagnetic interference testing of the satellite, which is always very fun because if something goes wrong, then you really worked hard to figure out what it was. Um, we opened the door and took the first image over Houston. And this is that image. The telescope was completely in focus, which is always a challenge. Um, telescopes on the ground have 1G effects. They are dragging on the optics, distorting them slightly. The optical benches like to absorb moisture, so they're usually out of focus on the ground compared to where we want them to be on orbit. So it lends itself to lots of interesting optical calculations as to where focus is when you get in orbit versus where what you've measured on the ground. And we actually run a focus mechanism on board these telescopes to assure that we can adjust once we get on orbit. But this was a great image. There was a lot of excitement went through the building. One of the challenges in any optical instrument like this is uh, dynamic range. So you're going from a bright object right here in this edge of this office building down into a deep shadow in a city. And actually, if you played with this digitally, you could look down into that shadow. But the detectors on the satellite have literally, in the space of half a meter, go from a really bright edge to something very dark. So they have to be extremely sensitive and very responsive to create city scenes like this. Uh, aircraft carrier in San Diego. Again, this was about two, three weeks after we launched. And the Eiffel Tower. So again, here are people walking along over the Seine. Uh, Eiffel Tower is here, obviously. And one of the interesting things is when you look at this, look at the, this image or any image that's got lines on it like this. Is the street line and the girders in the Eiffel Tower are actually smaller than the resolution is of the camera. So it sees lines. We can actually see high tension lines that are about two inches in diameter as long as against the right, right colored background. So I can't honestly tell you what the physics is behind that, but the camera operates a lot like your, like your eye does. So, certainly. These are 11-bit systems, so it's got about 2,000. And noise eats up a couple of counts on the bottom. Um, the, and then there's a, a lot of ground processing that goes on, what we call dynamic range adjustment, to balance out imagery to figure, because you can get everything from pink snowfields if you're not careful to good images. So this was the Worldview 1 focal plane. And each one of these chips right here, so I mean, literally, there are 50 of these chips 
that constitute this focal plane. And Worldview 1 is only a panchromatic black and white system. It has more pixels in it. Instead of 27,000, it's got 36,000. Each one of these is an individual CCD. And the fascinating thing about Eastman Kodak Company was they developed the digital CCD. And they had a complete lock on it, patent-wise. And they didn't think digital photography was going to hurt them from their film business. And they literally let the, the Japanese take the patents and go off and build digital cameras. So if you look at Kodak today, they're, they're in a fair amount of trouble corporate, company-wise. But they had the technology. I can you go, I go visit friends who are now working for ITT and are sitting on their bookshelves of the cameras that they built with the CCDs, originally for the US government and eventually started out in the commercial market. Each one of these is 70, 732 de detectors wide and 64 detectors in this way. So if you can imagine a line right here of one detector deep by 732, we're dragging this along the ground very precisely because each one of these half meter projections on the ground, each pixel literally will scan there for either one and one twelve thousandths of a second or now what we're using the satellite one twenty four thousandths of a second. And then when that line has moved off to the next half meter, the charge is transferred back one l layer, one line, so we can transfer the charge back 64 times. This is what's called time delay integration, and get 64 times more photons out of that. You know, the sensitivity doesn't go up in accordance with that because you're carrying noise along with it. But the bottom line is this whole string of 64 TDI elements then has to be dragged across exactly the same spot on the ground. Otherwise, we smear the image. So part of the attitude control system of the satellite is maintaining the orientation of all of these arrays. And then all of these arrays are literally lined up linearly this way, as well as this, as well as vertically, and even depth-wise within microns to be able to generate the geolocation accuracies we do. So this image comes down in 50 chunks which is then put together again back on the ground. Every pixel has a calibration coefficient that we measure on the ground so we can radiometrically recalibrate the image based upon the fact that every one of these little lines here, every one of these pixels has a slightly different response. Did you ever try to calculate the speed of objects based on the uh, We actually, well, we, we don't, we, we prefer not to have smear in the image, but what we do see on fast moving objects is the pan band will come across and the color bands will then come across slightly later. And you'll actually see a blooming on things like jet aircraft, where you'll see the jet aircraft, and then you'll physically see a shadow of it, a ghost of it, about 20 yards ahead. So yes, you could calculate speed, but on things like trains and automobiles, it's, they're too slow. If you were a SAR radar, you could see that. Um, I've talked about agility. Uh, QuickBird to scan from one target to another 200 kilometers apart took 50 seconds. And the Worldview satellites take 10 sec seven seconds to get there. And uh, these are the competition satellites, so this is obviously a marketing chart. But bottom line is these satellites are quite quick in terms of maneuvering. and that gives us the ability to cover very large areas. This is San Francisco, San Francisco Bay, obviously the surrounding territory. This is an example of what Worldview One could do. Scan this way, scan right back by reversing the, the CCDs, scan, scan, scan. So you can cover very large areas, and this is actually an early um, illustration. We could probably cover an area almost twice as large as this with an individual satellite pass coming overhead. Um, this one would probably be, let's see, this looks like maybe 100 kilometers coming down here. Um, that's probably two minutes. I'll come back to a video at the end of the presentation that shows that agility again. 
Um, this is a traffic circle in, in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Don't ask me why the hell that's the background on this particular image, but if you, when we geolocate at the 90th percentile, we're achieving about 16 meters in terms of absolute accuracy with, with some outliers, obviously, for the 90th percentile. That was with QuickBird with relatively coarse gyros, and this is worldview. So when I say we can tell you where you're standing with about five meters in absolute accuracy, that's the accuracy uh, for various, for the Worldview 1 satellite and for that matter the Worldview 2 satellite. So when we lay our imagery down on a GPS map, you know, the people who do GPS maps like to know how the streets line up with their vector maps. So it turns out that geolocation becomes really a very important part of the product spec, simply because it's kind of awkward if, you're, if your buildings are sitting in the middle of your streets. And of course, we snap them together after we get on the ground even better. These are, these are standalone accuracies right off the star trackers and the gyros. Um, Worldview 2. Wait, sure. Uh, certainly within the image. I don't have that number in my head, but... And then we use ground control points to make the actual accuracy much better than even the standalone. Yeah, I jokingly said at the early in the program that we should go to McDonald's and arrange to have every golden arch become a ground control point and go out and survey every McDonald's in the world. Uh, and the marketing guys just don't like technical inputs. Um, Worldview 2, bigger satellite, same bus size, uh, different telescope. What you're looking at here is a, a, what we call an outer barrel, which is actually surrounding the actual telescope, which is on the inside. These telescopes are, if you want very high accuracy geolocation, you need to thermally control them. And we literally control the telescopes down within a degree or so and maintain them isothermal. Um, and very accurately, so when they're not changing around, because that'll distort the line of sight of the system. Again, an aperture door. These are high gain antenna booms. We bring down data at 800 megabits a second um, off of this satellite. With These are redundant antenna booms. So these antenna booms, again, what the satellite's doing with its star trackers, it's, it knows always where it's pointing. It then calculates where the ground station is and points via two-axis gimbal right here, the high-gain antenna boom at the ground site. So we literally are pointing at Tromso, Prudhoe Bay, et cetera, whenever we come over it. It's both. Um, you know, space, space is an interesting, the satellites actually work better once they get in space and people can stop futzing with them on the ground. But it is a major challenge because on one hand, you've got sun coming in on one side at 1,000 watts per square meter. On the other side is deep space. And you've got a warm earth underneath you. So there's quite a challenge in this because individually, uh, these components are putting out, oh, it's probably 500, 800 watts of power. Now, that doesn't hardly sound like anything in your house. But in space, that's fairly significant. So these are thermal. Heat comes off of these boxes, goes through the surface of the bus here, and comes out to these fins, which are thermal radiators. The focal plane has a separate radiator right here for keeping it at basically 70 degrees, plus or minus a degree. There's a big battery focal plane on the backside here to keep the battery cool. I mean, a big radiator on the backside to keep the battery cool. And there's another radiator right here to keep the solid state memory cool. So it is a very complex thermal problem. Um, so again, a bigger satellite, weighed a couple of, thou couple of hundred kilograms more. Um, with the amount of fuel on board, it, it will not re-enter for 50 years at the altitude we have it at right now. The other satellites tend to come in at about 10 to 15. This is a photo of the satellite as it was being assembled. All the pieces were, were together in the ball floor, but before we actually assembled it. So the main bus was here. This went on top of this. That's the propulsion tank. This went on top of that. 
And then this outer barrel assembly, the black graphite epoxy, went on top of the whole thing. So it takes about four years to build one of these. I shudder to think how many electrical connections are actually in one of these. There's about 500 pounds of wire harness on the satellite. So despite the fact that we've got all sorts of ways for computers to talk to other boxes on, on uh, 1553 buses and things like that, there's still a massive uh, amount of wire harness work that goes on in the satellite. Launch day. Um, if you ever get a chance to go to a launch, I would certainly recommend it. If you go to Vandenberg, it's usually cloudy. This was an absolutely clear day, so it was a good omen. Um, World V2, whereas QuickBird had four color bands, which are good, perfectly fine for generating color imagery, World V1, for a variety of reasons, was only black and white, but World V2 added four more color bands. We added a coastal blue band a yellow band, a red edge band, which improves even vegetation, uh, understanding vegetative stress, and filled out the spectrum with, with what we call the near IR2 band. So that gives us an opportunity to do a lot more with the imagery and a lot more applications. This is a, an image of the Sydney Opera House. Um, let's see, we launched on October 8th and we opened it on 11 days later, so this was the second day after we had started taking imagery. Um, colors are more vibrant. Resolution is slightly better than the previous satellites, so again, you're seeing people walking around. Uh, lots of waves in the, in the water. This is also a picture of Sydney, and this is a false color image where we've used the multiple bands to pull out the vegetation. This is all concrete here. And obviously the vegetation is in red. This is a soccer stadium with uh, grass showing up as green. So it's an indication of the kind of things you can start to do by ratioing the spectral bands. German Embassy. And this is really a fascinating image. I mentioned that we have a, a coastal blue band in which we can actually penetrate uh, to through fairly clear water to the bottom. And this is off Abu Dhabi. Uh, here's the, the natural color image. And here's using the coastal blue band and several of the other bands in combination. But you're seeing down, these are probably 10 to 15 meter depths. But you can actually see down to the, uh, to the surface underneath the water, the land surface. So let me just talk a few minutes about operations and control. As I mentioned, these satellites are all operated out of Longmont. Um, we run 24-7, needless to say. Every orbit, we upload a new set of commands and tasking to the satellite. Um, the satellites are, we literally have three people operating three satellites and four ground stations. So there are only three people per shift. Highly automated. Uh, these are the images of the antennas at Tromso, Norway, Prudhoe Bay, Fairbanks. Prudhoe Bay is fun because it's very cold, it doesn't snow a lot, but the wind blows all the time. So everything in Prudhoe Bay is on stilts. Otherwise, you get a snow drift right over the top of the building because the snow will blow in one direction for two weeks, it'll turn around and blow in the other direction for two weeks. There won't be more than three inches of snow all winter up there, but it's a mess. Tromso, on the other hand, is a really fun place. It's north of the Arctic Circle. If you're in Oslo, Norway, the, Nor the Nor Norwegians are proud to point out that Tromso is as far north from Oslo as Rome is south from Oslo. It's a university town. It's a 50,000 person city. It's, it's a university town. And it hops all night long because in the wintertime, it's <laughs> basically all night. But it's, really, it's a very fun place to go. Um, and then Fairbanks is yeah, cold and not very interesting. But <laughs> we, we, do, we have thousands of orders sitting ready to be fulfilled at any given moment. So one of the big challenges in the company is how do you take all of those, figure out what satellite you ought to put them on, what orbit you ought to take them on, 
Somebody wants, some people want just an, an image of a small area. Other people want the state of Connecticut. So you have to figure out when you can do all of that. People want different sun angles. City planners want images with leaves off because they want to see the streets and the manhole covers. Other people want the leaves on. So there are seasonal constraints as to when you can take imagery. But we all do that all in the collection planning. Then the three guys I talked about right here generate the commands. They go out to the satellite. They go immediately up through the ground stations. We do not staff the ground stations. Uh, there's maintenance services available in the areas, but we don't have anybody sitting in these buildings. The data goes straight up to the satellite. Data comes right back down again. At 300 megabits a second is from all of these ground stations plus troll. Eventually comes in, gets combined with all of the attitude data so that you can actually create the image and turned into a customer product. Why are the ground stations in the polar regions? This is an image of the North Pole right here. You've got uh, Greenland, Russia, Alaska here, obviously Canada, Europe down here. So the ground stations we have in the northern hemisphere are here in Tromso, Fair Prudhoe Bay, and Fairbanks. And these are the coverage circles for different uh, altitudes of the satellites. So no matter what satellite comes over the pole here, it will intersect one or more of these ground station command com cones. So when the satellite comes up, for example, uh, let's see, that's 770, so the outer circle right here, you got a satellite comes up, hits this outer circle of, of Prudhoe Bay, starts receiving commands, transmits data all the way over to here, which and this particular pass would probably be about eight minutes of bringing data down. So the orbits are 95 or so minutes long. We actually get to talk to the satellites anywhere from six to 10 minutes in orbit. But the satellites also will overfly each other. So frequently we have multiple satellites in the comm cones at any given time. But that's the reason for the polar ground stations. If you put the ground stations down here near the equator, you get a little bump like this and you'll see two or three contacts a day as opposed to 15 contacts a day. So we complemented that with the ground stations in Troll in Antarctica. And the challenge in our Antarctica is getting the data back. We can dump the data to ground, but the comm links coming back from Antarctica are not anywhere as near the, the comm links from these locations. So that's inherently how we operate the satellites. Um, just in summary, all three are fully operational. QuickBird is nearing the end of its life, but only governed by fuel on board and the solar cycle. It turns out that the sun has been very quiet, much quieter than expected. And we're still in the, basically the minimum of the last cycle. So we've gotten more life out of QuickBird than we had expected. And Worldview 1 and Worldview 2 are, are fully operational and uh, meeting their specs. Haven't lost any redundancy, haven't had any failures generating lots and lots of data. So questions? Go. What do you use for compression of data? Do you use a compression? We use a proprietary compression uh, from the, on a satellite that Eastman Kodak had developed called ADPCM. And, uh, I'd have to remember the acronym. We're looking to go to JPEG in the future, but at the moment when this technology emerged, it was JPEG wasn't yet available and proven for space applications. So you do some of it on satellite, we, but once you get it into a ground computer, do you do any further compression? Well, we uncompress it to process it, and then usually when we send it out to customers, it, it goes into a customer-specific desire, which is usually a JPEG. Well, it wasn't designed to last 50 years. The, we've, the specs on these satellites were that either one of these satellites, well, QuickBird had a smaller tank, was designed nominally for a, what we call a mi minimum mission life of five years. Uh, we actually raised, the, well, we didn't raise the orbit, I'm sorry, on that one. The, uh, because of the solar cycle, we're getting a lot more than five years of fuel life out of it. So the governing factor is how much propellant is on it. These satellites have a much bigger set of tanks, and we've actually raised the orbit 
So the original spec says you have to be able to fly anywhere from 450 to 770 kilometers. At 450, the atmospheric drag is significant. At 770, it's non-existent. So that's the difference. It's the tanks are the same size. It's purely a question of the altitude we fly it at. And we don't, I don't expect the satellites to last 50 years. That would be phenomenal. But economically, you know, from a business standpoint, since we are sitting in the business school here, the damn well better last seven years. Otherwise, <laughs> they're not a good business proposition. <laughs> Reenters, burns up. So this costs a lot of money. How, how do you start from three people and get the money to, to, to go in this direction? D Digital Globe, is, as my boss would say, is as much an ex exercise in or an example of financial engineering as it was in technical engineering. And it started with a good idea and a handful of small investors. Um, then back in 95, two companies merged. One was a spin-off from Ball Aerospace, who actually had some resources. They put some money into it. Uh, that attracted some other people. Eventually, we started acquiring money from Wall Street. So the vast majority of the capital has come from venture capital firms, investment bankers. And then as they saw business plans improve, uh, you know, they've been we have about half of the price of Worldview One was government funded. The other three satellites were completely privately funded. So, and you're talking hundreds of millions of dollars. So, yeah, it's definitely an exercise. Every Christmas for the first five years, we thought we weren't coming back in January. Uh, what kind of uh, potential for uh, atmospheric measurements? Uh, if you know. It's purely a function of ratioing the bands. Um, you know, these satellites are interesting because we typically operate them five to ten minutes in every orbit out of 95 minutes. Of the 15 orbits, three of them are over water and we don't take imagery. The half of the orbit or a third of the orbit is at night and we don't take any imagery. So we have very expensive factories in orbit that we use about five to ten percent of the time. We'd love to find some applications for atmospherics, weather, clouds. We see a lot of clouds. We don't generate the kind of stuff that the weather guys want. But if you can ratio the bands, then you can presumably do some atmospheric work. It's not a, the science world is not a heavy funder of this kind of stuff. You know, there's not a lot of money, so they're not, in fact, one of our primary customers. So if you have any have any thoughts, let me know. Yes, sir. Weird question. Several months ago, there was a twelve forty five avalanche in Washington, climbers in China. Do you think it would have been possible to use your technology to find it? We could certainly get you an image within a day if there weren't any clouds. Well, we have right now 580 million square kilometers in the library, so there's a good chance that we have an image of the area. Uh, that's purely a function of the collection planning and customer requests. We, we do populated areas frequently, so coastal zones, major cities, things like that are done almost every, every several months, certainly within a year. If it's a remote area like a mountain or a desert, uh, one, we might not actually have it, but two, it probably isn't being refreshed that often. But there more than likely is a, is a base. The Earth has 140 million square kilometers of, of land mass. And we have about three times that in the library, but that doesn't cover everything on the land mass. So the United States is about 11, 12 million square kilometers, and we can take about 2 million square kilometers a day right now. We can take a picture of any place. Yeah. Are you, uh, are there certain things you're not allowed to distribute, or can anyone buy images? You can buy images of any place. So, you know, all the people looking for the little green men out in Nevada, and 
what is it, Area 52? <laughs> we've, got, we've got images of Area 52, and there are no little green men. Not that I expected them to be running around. <laughs> We're always filling up the satellites. We're always okay. taking our own speculative orders. And uh, on those images that you showed, um, the false color, how do you discriminate between grass and uh, other vegetation? Well, in that particular case, we're not. You have to kill the lights again. Actually, all of that, it's a slightly different shade uh, where the grass is versus where the trees are. But this is uh, an algorithm that simply pulls out vegetation. So as long as the vegetation is, is somewhat healthy and you can get a brown spots like here, you'll see the individual trees as well as the broad grass areas. So what is the green then? Green is actually concrete. Oh, okay. Or in this case, it's an asphalt track. Uh, an asphalt road. So yeah, that's not grass. If if I had the other image along, you'd you'd be looking at concrete. Some and some we take from input from science community or prior users. The answer to that's yes to about 10 kilorad levels. The second is a rather silly question. The space is full of debris. Hmm. Are you worried about the debris entering your telescope area? And you yeah, our insurance companies ask that question about every three months. Because every three months, somebody says something stupid like the Chinese and blow up a rocket at a high altitude. And, and literally, they added about 5,000 objects up there when they did that. Uh, it turns out that space is a very big place, and we went from having a probability of an, of an impact of like 1 in 100,000 or 1 in 200,000 to maybe 1 in 100,000 now. So, you know, the probability of an impact doubled, but the numbers were so small to begin with that it's not something that we really worry about from a business standpoint. But there are, if you, if you track, we do track the objects up there. We do density maps as to where the, most of the objects are. And uh, we like to stay below that, if, if at all possible. But that's an, uh, that's an increasing problem and will only get worse with time because eventually, you know, NASA guys back in 1970 were saying things will start bumping into each other and then there'll be an exponential growth. There's still only about one object every 50 kilometers square or something like that. I mean, space is a big place and you divide it into the number of objects. The interesting challenge is there are lots of things we can't see. Things that are the size of bolts could be up there in much greater numbers than the big objects that we can see. Nonetheless, it's been a very limited collision problem. I have a couple questions. What, all, what horsepower does it take control that satellite in the satellite itself. And then number two is, um, I'm assuming since uh, Worldview, both one and two are privately funded, you guys have some type of encryption between base station, ground station, and the satellite. Is the NSA still uh, controlled the keys to all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff? Yeah, we have an NSA approved encryption. We, the commands that leave Longmont are encrypted. And the data comes back is encrypted as well, although different standards. Sure. And uh, the control moment gyros, I don't have the numbers in my head, but you know, you're in space, there's nothing to react against. If I want to turn this way, you know, I'm standing on the ground and I just plant my feet. In space, you've got nothing to react against. So everything has to be done internal to the satellite. You have to exchange momentum to maneuver the satellite. And normally, you've got a reaction wheels that are typically about that big. And you can, you can imagine, you know, even, even a reaction wheel that weighs 10 kilograms spinning at, at a couple of hundred RPM doesn't generate 
a lot of momentum or torque. So the control moment gyros take those same reaction wheels, actually make them bigger. Instead of spinning them at a couple hundred RPM, they spin them at 6,000 RPM. And then you work against the gyroscopic stiffness of that to torque the satellite. So you get 10 times as much torque out of a control moment gyro than you do out of uh, reaction wheels and things like the space station run off of big control moment gyros that are as big as you are. That's a good point. <laughs> so, do you think that their uh, high resolution cameras could be, uh, play a role in tracking objects uh, down to the bolt side by pointing your cell not necessarily right at first? Um, that's certainly a possibility. It's not something we there's, there's, an always a, there's always a signal noise calculation to be made. So if you're staring out there and you're watching some object zip by, number one, you have to sense it. Number two, you have to know where it is. You have to get enough information on it. You know, it's, it's more than just say, boom, I just saw a light blip go by. You've got to figure out, well, you know, was it close to you, far away from you? What speed was it moving at? So you can, counting the objects is not the problem, figuring out where they are. And, Right now, the U.S. government runs collision avoidance analyses on all the objects up there. There are big computers crunching away constantly. The NASA runs it for the space station because they don't want anything. And every once in a while, you'll hear in the news that they want maneuvered the space station a couple of kilometers to get away from an object that was projected to come close a week from now. Okay. Uh, 